The Chalicothere's lifestyle, anatomical design, posture and locomotion are very different from those of virtually all quadrupedal ungulates, indicating convergence with other large, partially bipedal mammals such as ground sloths, great apes, and bears. Moropus was one of the most common animal alive in North America during the Miocene. Ankylotherium's habitat was the savanna. As an herbivore, it evolved to browse on vegetation on the trees in the grassy savannas of Africa. Most other chalicothers walked on their knuckles to avoid damaging their long claws which they used to hook around branches so that they could pull them down to the mouth, so it may be that Ankylotherium adapted to a slightly different way of feeding than its relatives. For most of its time Calicotherium would have been a quadrupedal animal that was not particularly fast but stable on its feet, however while the rear limbs were suited to constant contact with the ground and offered the main weight bearing support, the front limbs were only used for support when Calicotherium was walking forwards. It was quite a large animal for the Miocene which meant that the only animals that it had to worry about were possibly predators such as bear dogs like Amphicyon. South American tapir is an excellent swimmer and diver, but also moves quickly on land, even over rugged, mountainous terrain. It has a lifespan of approximately 30 years. It is known to run to water when scared to take cover. Tapirs are largely nocturnal and crepuscular, their proboscis is a highly flexible organ, able to move in all directions, allowing the animals to grab foliage that would otherwise be out of reach. The Malayan tapir is easily identified by its markings, most notably the light-colored patch that extends from its shoulders to its rear end. They have a large sagittal crest, a bone running along the middle of the skull that is necessary for muscle attachment. They also have unusually positioned orbits, all of these modifications to the normal mammal skull are to make room for the proboscis. This proboscis caused a retraction of bones and cartilage in the face during the evolution of the tapir. Metaminodon was semi-aquatic. Like the modern hippo, it was likely a grazer, feeding on grass and tough plant material at night and residing in the water during the day. It had small neural spines projecting upwards from the thoracic vertebrae, indicating weak neck muscles, which probably was due to buoyancy and a lack of necessity to support the head while submerged. Like the primitive horses, hyracodonts inhabited open forests and wooded steppes and turned from browsing foliage to grazing grass. They died out without leaving any descendants and they marked the end of the phylogenetic branch of hornless, running rhinoceroses. This small, fast-running creature was a close relative of the largest land mammal that ever lived, the 20 tons Paraceratherium. This animal may have been similar to that of modern large mammals such as the elephants. Because of its size, it would have had few predators and a slow rate of reproduction. It had large, tusk-like incisors and a nasal incision that suggests it had a prehensile upper lip or proboscis. Scientists suggest that animals as big as Indricotheres would need very large home ranges. Because of a scarcity of resources, there would have been little room in Asia for many populations or a multitude of nearly identical species. This principle is called competitive exclusion, it is used to explain how the black rhinoceros a browser and white rhinoceros a grazer exploit different niches in the same areas of Africa. Chilotherium were a group of grazing animals that radiated into several subgenera and species. Their feet were tridactyl and their legs shorter than in related groups. A few of them remained browsers, but most of them were adapted to a grass-based diet, hence the short legs. Teleoceras had much shorter legs, and a barrel chest, making its build more like that of a hippopotamus than a modern rhino. Like them, it was probably also semi-aquatic. Teleoceras had a single small nasal horn and was a quite heavy animal. Rhinoceratoids diverged from other parasodactyls by the early Eocene. Dyserotherium may have been one of the last to live in America. Known as Siberian unicorn, Elasmotherium was the size of a mammoth and is thought to have borne a large, thick horn on its forehead. 
Theories about the function of this horn include defense against predators, driving away competitors, sweeping snow from the grass in winter, and digging for water and plant roots. Unlike any other rhinos, its high-crowned molars were ever growing. Its legs were longer than those of other rhinos and were adapted for galloping, giving it a horse-like gait. The woolly rhinoceros was well adapted to its environment. Stocky limbs and thick woolly pelage made it well suited to the steppe tundra environment prevalent across the Palearctic ecozone during the Pleistocene glaciations. Like the vast majority of rhinoceroses, the body plan of the woolly rhinoceros adhered to a conservative morphology. Comparisons with extant perissodactyls confirm that it was a hindgut fermenter with a single stomach, and as such would have grazed upon cellulose-rich, protein-poor fodder. The Sumatran rhino is a mostly solitary animal except for courtship and offspring rearing. It is the most vocal rhino species and also communicates through marking soil with its feet. The last male died on 27 May 2019, leaving a female as the last remaining Sumatran rhino in the country. The species is considered functionally extinct in Malaysia. The Indian and Javan rhinoceroses, the only members of the genus Rhinoceros, first appear in the fossil record in Asia around 1 to 3 million years ago. Indian rhinoceros is considered to be in decline due to human and livestock encroachment, excessive hunting and agricultural development also reduced its range drastically. They are excellent swimmers and can run at speeds of up to 55 km per hour for short periods. They have excellent senses of hearing and smell, but relatively poor eyesight. The black rhino has a reputation for being extremely aggressive, and charges readily at perceived threats. They have even been observed to charge tree trunks and termite mounds. They are not very territorial and often intersect other rhino territories. Home ranges vary depending on season and the availability of food and water. Their skin harbors external parasites, such as mites and ticks, which may be eaten by oxpeckers and egrets. Such behavior was originally thought to be an example of mutualism, but recent evidence suggests that oxpeckers may be parasites instead, feeding on rhino blood. The white rhinoceros is the largest of the five living species of rhinoceros. The white rhinoceros is thought to have changed the structure and ecology of the savannas grasslands. Scientists believe the white rhino is a driving factor in its ecosystem. The destruction of the megaherbivore could have serious cascading effects on the ecosystem and harm other animals. The northern subspecies is considered to be doomed to extinction due to the death of the last male. Despite resembling the rhinoceros, Megacerops was larger than any living rhinoceros. Its dorsal vertebrae above the shoulders had extra long spines to support the huge neck muscles needed to carry the heavy skull. The skeleton of an adult male was found with partially healed rib fractures, which supports the theory that males used their horns to fight each other. Unlike many of the other brontotheres, there is no clear evidence that Embolotherium was sexually dimorphic. All known specimens have large rams. Therefore, coupled with the fact that the rams were hollow and fragile in comparison to the solid and sturdy horns of the North American brontotheres, such as Megacerops, it does not seem likely that the ram served as a weapon for contests between males. Unlike rhinoceros, the horns of brontotheres are composed of and were placed side to side rather than front to back, and despite their appearance they were more related to horses. They probably became extinct because they could not adapt to drier conditions and tougher vegetation that spread during the Oligocene.
Paleotherium is popularly reconstructed as a taper-like animal. Recent re-examinations of the skulls show that the nasal cavity was not shaped to support a small trunk, thus starting a recent trend to reconstruct them as looking more horse-like. Recent anatomical studies also suggest that Paleotherium, along with other Paleothere genera such as Hyracotherium, were closely related to horses. These animals were dog-sized herbivores that ate primarily soft leaves as well as some fruits and nuts and plant shoots. Propaleotherium had no hooves, having instead several small nail-like hooflets. They were herbivorous, and the amazingly well-preserved mesal fossils show that they ate berries, and leaf matter picked up from the forest floor. Mesohippus had longer legs than its predecessors. This equid is the first fully tridactyl horse in the evolutionary record, with the third digit being longer and larger than its second and fourth digits. Unlike earlier horses, its teeth were low-crowned and contained a single gap behind the front teeth, where the bit now rests in the modern horse. The Miocene was a time of drastic change in environment, with woodlands transforming into grass plains. This led to evolutionary changes in the hoof and teeth of equids. The brain of Marichippus was also much larger, making it smarter and more agile. Pleohippus was similar in appearance to Equus, but had two long extra toes on both sides of the hoof, externally barely visible as calloused stubs. The long and slim limbs of Pleohippus reveal a quick-footed step animal. Hipparion also lived in non-forested grassy plains, it resembled the modern horse, but still had two vestigial outer toes which did not touch the ground. Quaggas were said to be wild and lively, yet were also considered more docile than zebras. The distribution of stripes varied considerably between individuals, it was heavily hunted as it competed with domesticated animals for forage and was extinct in the wild by 1878. The unique stripes of zebras make them one of the animals most familiar to people. A wide variety of hypotheses have been proposed to account for the evolution of the striking stripes of zebras. The more traditional of these relate to camouflage. A currently leading hypothesis is that the stripes confuse the vision of biting flies. Like most members of the horse family, zebras are highly social. When attacked by packs of hyenas or wild dogs a zebra group will huddle together with the foals in the middle while the stallion tries to ward them off. Due to the limited resources found in their habitat, Somali wild asses live in a fission fusion society. Most adults live alone, but sometimes form small herds consisting of females and their young. Somali wild asses typically give birth in the spring, a common characteristic among equids, after a year-long gestation. Within hours, the foal is up on its legs and keeping up with its mother. Mongolian walled asses are known to dig holes at dry river beds and water sources to access to subsurface water to drink in response of the lack of water during hot summers in the Gobi Desert. Watering holes dug by asses are also used by other species as well as by humans to access to water. Its population is declining due to poaching and competition from grazing livestock. Most wild horses today, such as the American Mustang or the Australian Brumby, are actually feral horses descended from domesticated animals that escaped and adapted to life in the wild. Chevalsky horse has long been considered the only true wild horse extant in the world today, never having been domesticated. Horses maintain visual contact with their family and herd at all times, and have a host of ways to communicate with one another. This constant communication leads to complex social behaviors among Chevalsky horses. <laughs>